Bill Kibler uh, was educated in Kingsport City Schools and then also at Erskine College. He and his wife live in Anderson, South Carolina, Cindy and Bill have two sons. They're in their 20s. Not Cindy and Bill, the sons. <laughs> and Bill makes his living as a financial advisor. Uh, we are privileged to have him speak to us today about White City, this historic location. But before, uh, uh, I want to ask Anne if you wanted to add something. You said you had something you wanted to oh, add. Oh, I was just going to say that he has been a joy to me since the day he was born. He's <laughs> <laughs> had good challenges along the way. <laughs> and Bill, I know some of those stories. <laughs> I, I, I won't tell those. Um, <laughs> So, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker today, Bill Kibler. Wow, Kathy, thank you. What a group. What an amazing <laughs> thing. I apologize for talking in different directions. Now we can hear. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, it was, it was a, an awesome opportunity to come here. And Kathy told you a little bit about who I am, so I'm now going to tell you who I'm not. <laughs> um, I'm not a historian. And uh, I'm not an architecture expert or a city planning expert. In fact, my only credential for being here is that I was raised on this street in this neighborhood. Um, I want to just have a, a shout out to, to a couple of people. Of course, April, thank you for, for making this house available to us. We're going to talk a lot about this house today, a lot. I want to also reciprocate to my mom. There were challenges. <laughs> I didn't have a son, but uh, we got through it. Also, uh, would like to mention Nancy Parker Gideon. Nancy is the um, Maybe the elder states person of White City. Uh, your family lived here for many, many years and, and so many decades. So, and we're going to talk about your house too, Nancy, in a little while. Um, I lived here many years too. <laughs> that's right. Um, also, uh, we mentioned Brianna uh, uh, White with the city of Kingsport, uh, the archivist, who made some pictures available to us and was very helpful. Uh, Tim, it's intimidating to have someone from the Kingsport Historical Society videoing the historical presentation, but uh, um, we have a lot to talk about, Tim. Thank you. Now, I passed out folders, and I see some of you opening those, and that's what I do whenever I'm given a handout. And so I'll ask you to kind of bear with me. Uh, as, as we go through this presentation, I'll refer to specific materials. And there's one picture in particular I'd like to ask you to pull out. It's on the left-hand side, and it's the last picture, the very, very back picture. It's a color picture. It was taken in 1962. Okay, I'm the guy on the left. Uh, and I brought you that picture, that picture for two reasons. One is to to uh, bring you that as my credential for being the speaker today. The other is to let you know that I know I have 20 minutes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stay as close, as close to those 20 minutes as I can. And I'll tell you, it would be easy for me to talk for hours. And you'll see me stay pretty close to these notes. That is to keep me from wandering off down a lot of different directions because there is so much to talk about about White City and about Kingsport. In fact, um, some of my greatest memories of growing up in this neighborhood, as you all probably remember from your child, childhoods, it was different 50 years ago. Neighbors knew each other. We in White City sat on each other's front porches and visited. And, um, it, it was just a great, a great place to grow up. We would block off, somebody would block off the lower half of the Yaki Street and we would have potluck dinners right out there. All the neighbors would come. So it's a wonderful place with, with wonderful memories. Um, I could tell you stories of fame and glamour from White City from the, from the early days. Uh, a few almost famous people lived here. 
um, the brother of William Westmore, he was the, the commander of all our forces in Vietnam. His brother lived here and his, and his sister in law. Uh, the parents of a former president, George Herbert Walker, of Bush's parents, lived on Norwood Street briefly, and they were the kids. Um, we had, when I was here, uh, Charlie Marsh, the city manager, which we uh, believed uh, gave us a lot of political clout here on Yadkin Street. I mentioned glamour. Oh, we had glamour. Many of you will remember Vicki Lynn Hurd. Vicki Lynn Hurd was Miss Kingsport, Miss Tennessee, and the second runner-up to Miss America. And she lived for a summer in an apartment on the back side of White City yeah. on Watery Street. And, and we kids, the, the closest thing to royalty we had ever <laughs> we, we boys would go hide in the bushes and wait, and wait for Vicki to come out. And she knew we were there and she would come out and wave at us and we would run as fast as we could. Uh, you heard me mention we boys. We, there were a lot of kids in this, in this neighborhood when I grew up here, probably 20 or so that, that I can name close to my age. And uh, we played outdoors all the time, and, and the circle was where we played. The, the green median that you came around to come here, we called the circle, and it was our home away from home. We played baseball there, we played football there, and, uh, and just have many, many happy memories, as I do of this house. Um, we're going to talk a lot, again, a lot about this house uh, as we go forward. Uh, it was the Holston Lodge, and this house in its day was the pinnacle of high society in early Kingsport. This room and that room were where the biggest, most important parties happened, teas, dances. Um, just amazing, and, it, and I kind of get chills thinking about being in this room, decorated so beautifully for Christmas. Thank you for that, and, and uh, you'll see in your materials, and, and the materials on the right side there are kind of to take home and read. There are a lot of newspaper articles and, and things that I clipped out of, out of some old newspapers that you might, might enjoy. Um, Many of you already know something about White City. You know the construction of White City began in 1919. You know the houses were designed by an architect from New York named Clinton McKenzie. And you know that the houses were required by their deeds to be painted white, hence the name White City. That's about all I knew until I got that call from Kathy. And I realized I could never fill 20 minutes with, <laughs> with stories about Pinky Land Heard and, <laughs> and the architect that, that designed this neighborhood. The history of White City really goes back decades, maybe three decades uh, before 1919, to the imagination of a guy named George Lafayette Carter. Tim and I were standing over here talking about George Carter a little while ago and, and agreed that George Carter may be the most significant person in the history of the Tri-Cities. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about him, if I may, because it's so important to the story of White City. He was a self-made man. George Carter was a developer, a philanthropist, he was a railroad man. Um, George Carter started as a coal, mine, a coal man. He was in, from Hillsville, Virginia, and built a lot of coal mining towns in southwest Virginia and in West Virginia. And he had a vision, a strategic vision for building towns. He knew that coal represented money, and that to get that money out, you had to have trains. And to get the coal out of the mines, you had to have people, and to have people, you had to have towns. He understood how it all fitted together. And George was able to develop a lot of, of mining towns in southwest Virginia, and he was the founder of what became the Clinchfield Railroad. <coughs> George Carter had a bigger vision. Um, he had a big, audacious vision. He wanted to build a second Chicago. That was what he had in his mind. Second Chicago somewhere. How would he do that? 
those of you who may know a little about the history of Chicago know, would, may know that in the 1880s and 1890s, Chicago was kind of a second-rate meatpacking town on Lake Michigan. And Chicago itself wanted to distinguish itself, to somehow bring world attention to, to, to it, to, to the town. And so they decided to host the 1893 World's Fair in the city of Chicago. A lot of good things came out of the 1893 World's Fair. Now, see, you know I'm looking at my watch. I could wander them. I just thought I'd name a few. The Ferris wheel came from the uh, World's Fair, that World's Fair. Cracker Jacks, Wrigley's Gum, The Zipper, and Aunt Jemima's Pancake Mix all came <laughs> from that World's Fair. And one other thing. If you've read about that World's Fair, you know that they had a name for the fairgrounds. And the name for the fairgrounds was the White City. So keep that in mind. George had traveled through this area, had been to Kingsport, which was a little, a very small community of about 300 people on a riverbank, and had seen the vast Holston Valley, uh, flatlands and farmland around it. To kind of cut through the story quickly, um, he formed a company called, I would call it the Unica Corporation. Uh, and the Unica Corporation came down and bought 10,000 acres of land in pieces uh, that would ultimately become the city of Kingsport and would include White City. To build Second Chicago, uh, George Carter brought with him some guys from Virginia, from the coal mining area. He brought his brother-in-law, a young guy named J. Fred Johnson, with him. He brought a coal miner he knew named J.W. Dobbins. And um, they really weren't interested in, in the town of Kingsport, but they were interested in just using the name. So how do you build a town? How do you start from scratch with 10,000 acres and a name and build a town? This was the problem that, that they faced. And so the first thing they decided to do was recruit industry. Going back to his coal mining model, they felt like they needed to have jobs. The first company that they recruited was a cement company, uh, Clinchfield, I believe, uh, concrete company. And then they went to Pennsylvania and uh, recruited a company that would become the Kingsport Brick Company. And those guys built the town um, uh, around industry. Now, an interesting story, another story that Tim and I were talking about a little while ago, is what kind of happened within George's family. George began to get in a little bit of financial trouble. We don't know the story. I don't know the story of what caused his financial trouble. Part of creation of Kingsport meant creating a bank. They created a bank. He was chairman of the board. And uh, J. Fred Johnson was made president. His brother-in-law was made president of the bank. When George got in a little bit of financial trouble, George began to do some things that J. Fred did not approve of. Some people say kiting checks or at least moving money around. And at one point, J. Fred Johnson, president of the bank, refused to honor checks written by his brother-in-law, <laughs> George Carter, chairman of the board. Uh, you can imagine what a soap opera that must have been. Well, the chairman of the board can fire the president of the bank. And that's what he did. <laughs> but the acrimony in the family and the ill feelings uh, caused George to decide that he wanted out of the second whole second Chicago project. So he he pretty much decided to leave town. Which brings up a great <coughs> question: If you own ten thousand acres of land and all of the infrastructure that he had built, how do you sell that? You just don't go out and find somebody who will buy that. And so he went to New York and found a financier. And the financier's name was John B. Dennis, um, beginning to come up with a lot of names that we all recognize. John B. Dennis found a buyer, Colonel Blair, uh, in New York but with the Blair Company, who was um, willing to fund uh, the purchase of, of the land that the Unica Corporation had owned. Um, but Colonel Blair wanted somebody to, to kind of manage things down here, and so he sent John B. Dennis to live in Kingsport. And John B. Dennis needed an expert, a local expert, 
to run things, and he looked around and found a banker who'd been recently fired <laughs> named J. Fred Johnson. Okay. Now, these guys um, came together, this was about 1915. And you have to remember, Kingsport had a few industries in 1915, but they were small and there were still just a few hundred people living here. Now, the centennial of Kingsport is coming up, as you all know, um, next year. Kingsport was officially founded in 1917, and the first mayor was J.W. Dobbins, the former coal miner brought down by George Carr. So these three figures principally, among a lot of others, but John B. John B. Dennis and J. Fred Johnson and, and uh, Mr. Dobbins really formed the, uh, the group that we think of as our, city, our earliest city fathers. Okay, so Kingsport was incorporated. Um, they wanted to build a prosperous community. The more I read about these guys, the more I really liked them. They wanted only industries to come that would contribute to the community, that paid fair wages, that provided good jobs. They wanted the town to be uh, really a model. And we've all heard Kingsport as the model city. Um, their vision caught on. By 1919, the town had grown from about 900 people to 10,000 people, which if you think of from a percentage standpoint, that's amazing growth. So amazing that it caught the attention of the New York Times and even international publications, which referred to Kingsport not as the model city, but as the magic city. Kingsport, for a while, was known as the magic city. Um, these guys came together, J. Fred and uh, John B. Dennis and, and John B. Dennis's brother came together and created the Kingsport Improvement Company. I believe you all met in the building of the Kingsport Improvement Company recently. Um, so, um, what a great name for a company, right? How could you argue with anything that they did? Uh, they're here for improvement. They worked very closely with Mayor Dobbins. So, Another fascinating to me um, aspect of the growth of Kingsport was that it was a very successful public-private collaboration, something that is really hard to do successfully, and, and, they, and they pulled it off. I wanted to talk a little bit about how they did it. They hired John Nolan of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he was a nationally known uh, master city planner to come down. His master plan that he drew up for Kingsport is still more or less the master plan the town operates under today, certainly the downtown area. They hired a division of the Rockefeller Foundation to write the charter and the plans for city government. And the Rockefeller Foundation's plans are still basically the plans that our city government here is using today. Um, they deliberately decided to position the industries of the day down together next to the river. And I read that their idea behind that was that because of the prevailing winds, all the smoke and dust would blow the opposite direction. Those of us who grew up under, uh, uh, around Eastman Kodak might argue that it didn't work out quite that way, at least back in the smell 60s. Of money. The smell of money. Well said, well said. They realized the importance of a quality public school system. These guys were ahead of their time. They hired Columbia University to write a public school plan for the city of Kingsport. It was in the middle of all this magic that John Nolan suggested that they needed an architect, somebody with, who could bring together this common vision and design the schools and the public buildings and the neighborhoods. And so they hired a successful New York municipal architect named Clinton McKenzie. He was a visionary yeah, with all of these visionaries working together. And they decided it was time to build a model neighborhood, a neighborhood in which all the homes met a very high standard of appearance and construction. They believed that the people of this neighborhood um, should be a diverse group. And they wanted homes in this neighborhood to be both large and luxurious and small. And they wanted to build it around a centerpiece structure, which we are in right now, the, Hol the Holston Lodge. Um, they 
wanted to surround it with schools, which they did. And they had the idea of the, of, in the back of their mind that went back to George Carter that perhaps it could be called the White City. And so that's the origin attributed to the name White City. As I read about White City, I began to get confused. And, and I went through old newspapers and saw White City, 67 houses in White City. And, and there were so many things about, you know, the Kingsport Improvement Company is going to build 67 houses. And I looked at the map because I didn't remember 67 houses on Yadkin Street and Norwood Street. And I counted them and there were 30. And I said, what, what's going on? And White City is not just Yadkin Street and Norwood Street. And this was a real surprise to me. Myrtle Street, that way, had white homes built too. And they were the smaller homes. Um, because part of their dream was to build a, a residential community that all people could afford to live in, they included smaller houses, larger houses, and in their mind, all of that was White City, not just, not just Yadkin Street. The Holston Lodge was the first building completed and served, as, again, as the centerpiece. Um, they had low down payment. They told people they weren't people weren't paying for the land. It was just for the house. I mean, I say they told people, I'm <laughs> not implying anything, but, but um, it made it very affordable. And they financed, and I thought this was kind of odd, they financed it for 11 years. Um, and people started buying the houses in 1919 and 1920. In hindsight, I think about having an 11 year mortgage that started in 1919, you'd have it paid off by 1930, which I hope that a lot of these folks did because of, of the uh, depression that, that followed. The houses um, sold very quickly. There are pictures in the left hand side of your materials, and, and uh, Brianna made a number of pictures together, uh, available uh, to us. The first one that you see on top is the building that you're sitting in now. Uh, that is the lodge in its earliest days, and it was the first structure completed. And, and forgive me for not quite having enough of these. We'll make these pictures available to, to everybody who may not who may not have. Oh, have a I have an extra. Um, the second picture, and I'm going to look. Okay, this is the white. The second picture is the White City, that is Myrtle Street. And standing in the kitchen just a few minutes ago and looking out the window, that I believe is the view, the view that I saw um, out the back window. The third picture. Thank you. Is another shot of, of um, houses being built. The, the house in the foreground is the what I think of as the Westmoreland house. Okay, if you move to the fourth picture. Okay, this was taken from what is now the circle. If you look down in the left hand corner, um, you'll see that white structure. That is, again, the building we're in now. That's the Holston Lodge. If you look to the far right, uh, that is the Parker House, what we called the Parker House. Max Parker was an industrialist in Kingsport who came along a few years, just a few years after Kingsport's original founding, founding fathers, and he was the uh, head of the Holliston Mills. And um, I'm not sure, Ms. Nancy, when you all moved into, the, uh, into that house? 1926. 1926. Is that not amazing? That's, that's wonderful. The, the final picture from this group is that same house. I, I had a lot of fun looking at the, the house being built and looking at that final picture. Ms. Nancy, I don't know when that picture was taken. Um, but it was a long, it was a long time ago. I think it was the 1930s. I couldn't, couldn't be sure of that.
Well, skipping ahead a little bit, in 1920, J. Fred Johnson made a fortuitous trip to Rochester, New York, to call on a gentleman named George Eastman. And he persuaded George Eastman to bring an alcohol distillation plant to Kingsport and locate it on the Holston River. At that point, the magic city, the model city, went into hypergrowth mode because Eastman came and then all of the industries that began to spring up to support, uh, to support Eastman. Clinton McKenzie was still here. In fact, he was living in the Holston Lodge much of this time and, and designing schools. He designed uh, Washington School, Kingsport High School, which is it, if you go down the hill at the end of the Atkins Street and look up the hill, that's the old Kingsport High. He uh, designed Lincoln School, Jackson School, uh, Booker T. Washington School, and Douglas School. Um, he built 175 more homes in the neighborhood between Oak Street and the Bristol Highway. It took me a while. I, I kept seeing these references to the Bristol Highway, and I said, that's Stone Drive. I don't understand. <laughs> it's Center Street. I, it took me a little while to figure that one out, but it, but it was Center Street. I would like to talk for a moment about the Holston Lodge, um, the, the home we're in today. Uh, when you read the names in these newspapers, I included a few of these stories in the, in the folder, but you'll read names of the people who attended parties here. And it was Mrs. J. Fred Johnson and you know, Mrs. Parker and, and so many folks who, who were very important in the day. Uh, there's, there's a newspaper article about um, a dance that was held here, uh, I believe in 1923, and talked about playing the piano and, and gathering around the record player, and the decorations for Christmas were so beautiful. And it's just neat to, to read all of that stuff. I found it included a letter to the ed a letter to the newspaper, no, a letter to Santa Claus, a letter to Santa Claus written by a five-year-old child of the second family that managed this place. The first, the, the Kingsport Improvement Company retained ownership of this, uh, of this lodge, the Holston Lodge, for a long time. And the Mayan family uh, was the first, as far as I could find, the first family to run it. They left in around 19, in late 1923 and uh, brought in the McClellan family who ran it until 1928. Sometime in the late 1928, early 29 era, the Kingsport Improvement Company closed the Holston Lodge and took all the furniture and moved the management and the furniture to another hotel. And then they sold the lodge to the George Wilkerson family. And Mrs. Wilkerson uh, still lived here when that picture with me looking at my watch was taken. Uh, again, the lodge was where you stayed in Kingsport from 1920 to 1928. It's where you had your parties. It's where you went to see the movers and shakers. And, and honestly, this is kind of the meta view of, of the 1920s. That thought occurred to me. So anyway, and, and, and Mrs. Wilkerson, the Wilkerson family tried to maintain that standard, but then the Depression came, and Kingsport really didn't need that type of place. And you'll see another ad in there from the Depression era, uh, advertising room rates, a dollar a night for two men or two women, and you could get a garage, and they had a community bath, and, and, uh, and I think one meal a day. Um, I mentioned, I didn't mention, but one of uh, the, uh, Clinton McKenzie's greatest architectural works was the Kingsport Country Club. It was way out the Bristol Highway. Uh, I think about where Dobbins Bennett High School is now. And that, and that, that, that far out in the country. And, um, a group of residents helped build that country club, including Max Parker. He was, he was um, integral in that process. The uh, country club was said to have the best water hazard hole in America. 
and I'm sure it was good. But the clubhouse burned, and uh, Max Parker was involved in um, raising money to build a new clubhouse for the Kingsport Country Club. He also, by the way, was a co-founder of Richfield's Country Club. It meant a lot to this community. But shortly after the new country club was completed, a dance was held. And I would now ask you to pull the picture out of the back right-hand side. And if you can read the caption, you can see that on the right, that is um, Ms. Nancy Parker. or discussion or, or thoughts. Um, the two girls in the picture uh, were my sisters, uh, who I recall thinking were never on time for anything. <laughs> and they don't know that I'm showing you that picture. <laughs> Question, how many guest rooms were in the lodge? I remember reading that there were 11. Do you, does that sound right, April? Yes. 11. Yeah, there's blueprints over there. Yeah. Yeah. April, yeah, that's great. Uh, and you may want to talk about that in a minute. But blueprints, original blueprints in the room over there. And um, so uh, 11. But there, you'll also see an ad uh, for, for, for the Holston Lodge recruiting a nurse. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know if there was a full-time nurse that lived here, or uh, certainly they had they had staff as well. It, I was amused. I'm going to embarrass my mom uh, a little bit. She, we we talk every Saturday morning uh, on the phone when I don't don't uh, get to come see her, and and she said. Are you are you dreading this? Are you dreading this? I said no, no, I'm not at all. This has been fascinating. It's a lot of fun. She said, I assure you, they are really sweet people. <laughs> she said they are so nice, and you were right. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Uh, 